Okay. Uh, can you see it? Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. Uh, well, we yeah, I'm going to give the first uh, faculty orient, uh, orientation talk. And uh, I'm going to talk about uh, deep learning from an uh, alchemist to a theoretical alchemist. Uh, my name is Yuan Zhi Li Di. I'm an assistant professor at CMU. Okay. Uh, so hello everyone. So welcome to the machine learning department uh, in CMU. You see this is a fantastic playground uh, that you are going to go through. Okay. So of course, when you decided to come here, you probably have already decided to study machine learning or doing machine learning research as your career. Okay. And nowadays in particular, if you want to do machine learning, you probably want to do deep learning. Okay. So basically, you, try, you are going to do this fantastic stuff that you are spending all your effort and trying to improve the performance by 0 0.00001%, okay? So to do deep learning research, there are, like very, there are three very, very simple steps that you want to take, okay? So typically for deep learning research, the first step is you basically want to obtain as many GPUs as you can Okay, and then you submit as many experiments to the queen as you can. Okay, and after that, you obtain some intuition on which learning rate or model choice, augmentation, training schedule, VDK, batch size, noise schedule, or even the magic word that you say at the beginning of the training that gives you a better solution. Okay, so you have some intuition. And now you try to redesign your experiments following the intuition collected from two. Okay, so these are the three steps. And this process is also known as GSD, which is a short uh, version for graduate student design. Okay, so you have this intuition and experiments, then you interact with that and try many, many different trials, and eventually, hopefully, you improve the uh, final performance of your deep learning model by like 0 0.01%, okay? So this is a, a typical deep learning process that a graduate student might take, okay? So here are some examples about the intuition that you collect uh, when running deep learning experiments. So the first intuition, of course, everyone wants to use is that if your model reached zero training error but the general, generalized badly, then you probably want to throw a larger model, okay? So intuitively, for deep learning, a larger model generalized better. Or if your model is too hard to train, and so you also want to throw, uh, in this case, you also want to throw a larger model. Okay, for deep learning, larger models also are easier to train. Okay, uh, for example, you have a large model and you have a swarm of GPUs, then you, you win the game for deep learning, such as this GTP3. Okay, and you also have some uh, collect some intuition. For example, adding noise in the training always helps, but you shouldn't add too much noise. Okay, the scale is really important. And then you have uh, other intuitions such as ensemble, which is average the output of a few deep learning models always improve the accuracy, but this is too good. Okay, so you shouldn't really write it in the paper, otherwise the reviewer will say that this is an unfair computation. Okay, on the other hand, you can use over parameterization, which makes your model 50 times larger. That's considered fair computation computation, okay, comparing to a model that is uh, 50 times smaller, okay? So you have all these kind of intuitions. Okay, so these intuitions are very, very good, but sometimes, you know, these intuitions may contradict to each other, okay? For example, uh, somebody may tell you, you should use similarity-based learning, which is making sure that the output uh, each, the, each layer of the neural net only learns one features per class. Okay, this is called similarity-based learning. 
And sometimes people may tell you that diversity-based learning actually works better. And diversity-based means that for each layer of the neural net, you want, it to, you want the model to learn as many features as possible. Okay. So you have a uh, different like contradictory uh, training method that both leads to better solution comparing to you not doing anything. So, I mean, but they contradict to each other, okay? So which one should you take? And sometimes the intuitions are also very hard to understand. For example, your model reached zero training loss but generalized badly. This means overfitting, okay? So why does a larger model reduce overfitting in deep learning? And your model is too hard to train, means that the model probably is already too complicated. Then why a larger neural net is less complicated in deep learning? Okay? These intuitions are pretty hard to understand, but they work in practice. Okay? So this is my research work. So my research work aims to turn this intuition to formal theories. Okay, so when they work or not work, you know why they are working and you know why they are not working. Okay, so now you no longer interact with your intuitions using this magic potion. You also interact with theory using formal mathematics and to guide the intuition. Okay, just to give you an example about uh, uh, my research. And the first question, of course, everyone uh, wants to ask is why do we actually use deep learning instead of shallow learning? Okay, intuitively, I mean, you have all these experimental results demonstrating that deep learning works so well in practice, but I mean, mathematically, what can you say about why should we use deep learning instead of shallow learning? Okay, so you have this deep learning that has multiple uh, units of linear plus ReLU, Okay, versus this shallow learner that only has one pre-processing layer that collects the features and go through a linear uh, combination of them. Okay, so why is this deep learner on the left-hand side better than the shallow learner on the right-hand side? I mean, empirically, it's better, but theoretically, mathematically, why? Okay. So uh, in the past works, we have shown in theory that deep learning is capable of performing efficient hierarchical learning, which outperforms shallow learners. Okay, for example, you have the training data. The training data usually contain a hierarchy. In the training data, there are simple, simpler training examples, such as in this training data, there are examples associated with basic calculus. And there are examples that are a little bit harder associated with basic algebra. And then there are hardest examples that are associated with linear algebra. Okay, for images, you may think of uh, some images that are like in the standard position, some images are not so standard, and some images are just uh, very weird. Okay, and for these deep learners, uh, and it can actually automatically distribute the data with different difficulty into different layers of the neural net to learn it, okay? And of course, when you, after you learn basic calculus, learning basic algebra is not that hard. Okay? After you learn basic algebra, learning linear algebra is not that hard. So deep learning can decompose the hierarchy of the data set into different layers of the neural net, okay, to reduce the learning uh, difficulty. On the other hand, the shallow learning leads uh, uh, needs to learn everything you know, from this linear layer, okay? So if in this linear layer, it has to learn everything from scratch, and this will boost the complexity by a lot, okay? We are, uh, in the past research, we have shown formal theory demonstrating this power and also giving lower bounds, showing that shallow learner really cannot do hierarchical learning, okay? And on the other hand, we also show how deep learning performs efficient hierarchical learning in theory. Okay, we identify the forward feature learning step as a backward feature correction step in theory. Okay, for forward feature learning st uh, step, you basically learn higher level features using, low, using the combination of lower level ones. And in the backward feature correction step, you are trying to correct 
lower level features, okay, when you try to train the higher level ones. So basically you twist the lower level ones in order to be the best result for the higher level ones, okay. So there are two critical steps and my research basically uh, combines uh, experiments. I mean, in the past years, my collaborator and I has uh, used in total like 100,000 GPU hours in the past year okay, to run these experiments. And then with like a lot of intuitions, then we develop formal theory for these intuitions and to show that why deep learning actually works. Okay. And usually the theories are very in deep and typically there are 80 pages plus proofs and then there are 40 pages experiments so the papers are typically long but I think it's worth it for uh, doing hardcore try hard deep learning research. Okay. And just give you another example. Uh, as I mentioned, ensemble of simple average of output of a few uh, models improves the final test accuracy. Okay, so why is that true? I mean, there is a traditional reason saying that, okay, each model, I mean, you train it from like random seed using different random seed, so they should make mistakes in different data. Okay, so you're taking the majority, you'll probably get the best of all. Okay, this is a traditional wisdom saying that the average of those models actually uh, improves the test accuracy. But this is actually not true. Okay, and for example, you can construct a very simple uh, like synthetic data set where your target function, you want to decide whether uh, an output of a three layer unknown ReLU network F is going to output of this network is bigger than zero or not. Okay, so this is a classification problem and you have a learner network, which is a three layer ReLU network. Okay, you have uh, 10 of them. Okay, you can just perform some simple experiment. You will see that if you train uh, each model using SGD starting from random initialization, you use proper weight decay, you use cross entropy laws. Okay, then ensemble these models does not improve test accuracy. Okay even when these models are making mistakes as different data points, okay? So, I mean, ensemble does not work unconditionally. Okay? You have this data set, you use, uh, you train the neural nets and you ensemble, it's not going to work. Okay, so basically in the past years, we have developed theorem uh, showing how ensemble works by learning from multiple views. In particular, in a data set, you usually can, uh, for example, in a vision data set, you usually can classify an uh, image using like any of these signals. Okay? For example, you can say this is a car because there's a light, this is a car because there's a wheel, this is a car because there is a window. Okay? You can classify the data, uh, most of the data using any of these views. Okay? So in, in this case, each model typically it will pick some subset of the features, okay, depending on the random initialization or the randomness uh, in the algorithm. Okay, but I mean, you have some very weird data uh, probably appear in some weird position that you don't get to see all of the features. Okay, for example, you have a car that only shows you a wheel, then you're using the light as a feature it's not going to classify uh, it correctly. So when doing ensemble, you actually collect all the features you learn. Okay. Uh, for example, you have this model one, you have this model two, and you combine the best of both. Okay. We have developed formal theory showing that uh, how do you how do you actually combine all the features in ensemble, and then we also. Uh, uh, a very long sequence of experiments justifying that this, the power of ensemble really comes from the multi-view of, uh, of the data. Okay, so this is basically my style of research and I'm looking for uh, students that are interested in uh, both theory and uh, practice in deep learning. So, uh, I mean, if you want to do research in this uh, 
direction, please do not hesitate to contact me. Okay, thank you.